All right. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'm a lead pastor here, and we're going to get into Mark chapter 10. Uh, if you're new to New Hope, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, it's so grateful that you uh, chose to show up and worship with us this morning. If you don't know what we do here, our sermons, we go through books of the Bible, because we want to make God's Word make sense to our everyday life. Amen? And, uh, and so that's what we do. We create this thing. It's called our series guide. And uh, with that, you actually get to cheat. And you're not going to get in trouble. Anybody cheat in school before? This is not, no, don't raise your hands. All right. Um, but what we do is we create this so that you can read along with us as we go through the book that we're studying. Like we're in Mark chapter 10. And on the front is a simple way. If you don't know how to pray or spend time with God, that's okay. We want to give you a simple tool to use. That's on the front of this. Okay. Um, it's called the SOAP method. So you read some scripture, you make an observation. How does that apply to you? And P is prayer. All right. It's really easy. And then on the back is the reading plan. It has scriptures for you to read each day. Uh, we give you five days worth. So you have some grace days right? So it's like, oops, I missed it, but I can, you know, catch up throughout the week. Um, But grab one of those, and on the bottom, there's always a memory verse, right? Because we want to hide God's Word in our head, so it moves to our heart and changes our hands, how we live, right? We use it in our life, and uh, the memory verse that we are on right now is Mark chapter 12, verse 30. It's going to be verse 30 and 31, but verse 30. Let's read this out loud together, okay? Here we go. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Right? I'll do motions, maybe. We'll teach you motions on how to. Um, but it's, it, that is a great thing. This is uh, where Jesus is saying the greatest commandments. And the first one is just, just love God, right? Love him with all you got. And, and that's the other half is love people. So if you've got love God and you're loving people good, boom, you're living all of the commands of all the Old Testament and all in the New Testament. That is the heartbeat of heaven right now is wrapped in love, right? And, uh, and some of us, maybe today is the day that you receive and experience that in a very personal way. But, uh, but yeah, that's the memory verse. Now, we're going to hop in into the book of Mark. If you want to get there, you can open your Bibles. If you have a Bible with you, a physical Bible, that's awesome. If you don't have one, we have Bibles in the baskets on the other side of that wall. Grab it, take it home with you, write your name in it. It's our gift to you. Um, there's also lots of apps you can download on your phones. Here's my encouragement. If you use a Bible on your phone, turn off all your notifications, okay? Because so often you'll hear bing, bing, buzz, buzz, and oh, what's the score? Whatever. I don't know what, what you're looking at, but um, they're playing a game. But let's stay focused on God's Word this morning. Sound good? Okay. Now, as, before I get into this, um, who in here loves ice cream? We got any ice cream people? All right. <laughs> These are my people. All right. <laughs> my people showed up this morning. That's awesome. Ice cream is just, it's just good, right? Like you can, be, you can eat such an amazing meal and be filled up to here, but there's always room for ice cream, right? Uh, I love the phrase my good friend Sam says. There's, it fills in the cracks, right? It just kind of gets in there and, and uh, it, it makes you... All right, preach it. Ice cream. Let me tell you a story, Okay. Um, when our oldest son, Grayson, um, was 16 and he got his driver's permit, um, whenever a kid gets a driver's permit, they, they have to um, get a number of hours in driving with an adult as a part of the process of getting their driver's license. I think it was something like 50 hours of driving, okay? And so, you know, I, I, there may be parents that signed the legal document at the DMV that didn't get the 50 hours, right? It's like, um, but we, we did our best with, with, our, um, with our son Grayson to do that. And so, have you ever been scared? <laughs> now, here's the thing. He, Grayson's a good driver, and, and I'm grateful, and he's a really good driver. But there were some learning moments, you know, like, <laughs> like when you have a teenager beside you, and they're driving for the first time, that, that uh, I decided if we're going to do this for 50 hours— I'm going to need some motivation, all right? And, uh, and we, uh, I didn't do this to the other boys. Sorry, guys. It's because it started going to my waist. We ended up saying, okay, we're going to drive for, you know, an hour or two, and then we're going to stop at Gern Heights, you know, and, uh, and get some ice cream. And I was always excited. What's the flavor of the week? You know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and that kind of became our routine of getting probably more ice cream more often than we should have or than I should have. Um, but it was a motivation, right? And so when it became, hey, Dad, do we want to drive? I would say yes. Why? Because there might be ice cream, right? There might be ice cream. So 
Ice cream is delicious and it's good. Now, let's go back to when you were a kid. Think about when you were a kid. In some of this room, this may connect with some of you, it may not. But uh, when I was a kid, I had to go with my mom running errands around town, right? And, uh, and the, we'd always have to stop at the bank. Now, as a kid, I don't know what happens at the bank. You know, I'm just like, yay, the bank. But I got excited about the bank. Why did I get excited as a kid about the bank? Suckers. Suckers. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, they got candy there, and it's free. They're just giving it away. And I'm like, the bank just gives away candy. That's what a bank is, right? Like, I learned later that's not what a bank is. But, but the reason I wanted to go with mom to the bank wasn't because we had to pay bills, and we had to, like, get cash out and deposit checks. It's like, I wanted the candy, right? Why am I talking about these things? Because we're about to see and jump into Mark chapter 10, and Jesus asks a question, and the question is, what do you want me to do for you? And, uh, and we're going to actually look at James and John that Jesus asked that question to, and we're going to look at another guy by the name of Bartimaeus who Jesus asked that question, but here's the reality. Jesus asked that question every day. And, uh, and some of us, it's like, I want ice cream, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to, give me ice cream, give me the soccer, give me the, you know, and and yet, uh, we want to, I don't know, I want God to open our eyes to something today. And the only way that can happen is if the Holy Spirit's working through us, okay? The, my words, just so you know, they're just, you know, they, like they can just drop to the ground. The thing that's going to impact you the most is whatever God speaks straight to you. That has nothing to do with what comes out of my mouth, right? And so today, we're going to read a part of the passage, and I'm going to pray for us, that God would speak to each of us as we think about the question, what do you want from God, really. Okay? So if you have your Bibles, let's stand together as we're going to read kind of the starting passage um, for the morning as we dig into this. Um, I'm just going to be reading the first few verses of chapter 10, starting in verse 32. Um, and this is what it says. This is Jesus with, with his disciples. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem, right? That's the path they're heading towards, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise." God, as we get into your word right now, and we see Jesus teaching his disciples about the kingdom of heaven, about the reality of this earth, and about who he is, would you open our eyes to the kingdom of heaven, the reality of where we are, and who Jesus is? We, we so often let our minds go places um, that lead us away from those things. And so today, if there's any noise inside of us, if there's any thoughts that are distracting us, if there's anything the enemy is trying to do to attack and confuse us, would you remove that in Jesus' name? And prepare our hearts, our hands, our minds to hear and receive what you want us to hear and receive this morning. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 Awesome. You guys can have a seat. You can have a seat. So we see right now in chapter 10, last week, if you missed last week's message, just, <laughs> I don't take this lightly. When my wife says that was your best message ever, I just take note of that, okay? So it was a really good message last week. If you missed it, um, go back and watch it because there are some deep heaven truths that can impact your life on earth that brings heaven to earth, okay? And, um, and yeah, so go back and watch that. But we see that Jesus has these encounters with individuals and the disciples are watching, right? And Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, about him, about the kingdom of heaven, as they're watching him do things. Last week, it was a conversation with a rich young ruler, a Jewish man who wanted to follow Jesus and asked, how can I get to the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus calls him out right in the spot that was hindering him from coming to Jesus, which was his money, his resources. And Jesus says, sell all you got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And he walked away what? Sad. He didn't follow Jesus. He went back with his position, his possessions, instead of following after Jesus. He went away sad. We don't want to walk away sad, right? We, we, want, we want to follow Jesus. And so the disciples are learning something, and, you know, Peter's like, well, we've given up everything, right? He's like, we've given up everything for you, Jesus, to follow you. You know, Peter, the first to talk, you know? And, and, so, and so Jesus is like, yes, yes, you have. And don't worry. 
what you've given up, all the things you've lost, you will get here in this age and for eternity. It's like, okay, mind's blown. So imagine being the disciples hearing that after seeing this rich young ruler who has everything. Now their minds are spinning. Does that mean I get that plus a hundredfold? You gotta be kidding me. So they're, who knows what they're thinking at this moment with what Jesus is telling them. But he always ends with this, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. He's teaching them the kingdom of heaven is upside down to this kingdom we live in. And he's going to continue to teach them that as we get into what we're looking at right here. This is the third time Jesus has told his disciples, this is what's going to happen when we get to Jerusalem. He's like, the son of man is going to be, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be mistreated. He's going to be killed. Three days later, he's going to rise again. And all three times, pew, right? <laughs> have, have you ever like read something in scripture and it just goes right over your head? Can we be honest, right? Like there's times that that happens. So you're in great company. They were right with Jesus and it was still over their heads because they were still learning. They were still understanding. If you're learning, awesome. Welcome to a safe place to learn. All, all, all our heart is, for you is that wherever you are with Jesus, you're just pointing towards him. That's it, right? It doesn't matter how far away or how close you are or how much you know and don't know. If you're pointing toward, toward him, that's what Jesus longs for. And we're going to see that in the story today, okay? We're going to see that. And so we're going to keep reading in this passage at, at, right after he told them this. And it still just went over their heads. We, we see James and John come up with a scheme, all right? The two brothers called the Sons of Thunder, right? Uh, that's what Jesus labeled them. <laughs> Imagine being like, like Jesus changes your name and like, um, you know, Peter gets the name Peter, which is rock. And, uh, and then these two brothers, he goes, you guys are the sons of thunder. It sounds like a wrestling team, right? Like you guys are rough around the edges and just like, ah, you know, like that's, that's kind of like what's going on here with James and John. Um, and so we see this, this scene continue to unfold as they just heard this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> okay, we read, I think it's in Matthew's version of the story where we read a little bit more into this because also their mama was a part of this conversation, okay? <laughs> any mamas in the house, right? We got any mamas? Do we have any helicopter mamas? The ones that kind of hover really close and make sure like my kids are gonna, you said what? You know, like that, that kind of mama? So, so we read that she kind of like sets up the conversation with Jesus and then like here they go. Like we want, <laughs> we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now if you were Jesus, <sighs> this is one of those, I w if I were Jesus, it would be one of those and Jesus side moments, right? Like, <sighs> come on guys. Did you just not hear what's going to happen to me? No, <sighs> right over their heads. Did you just not hear the last will be first, the first will be last? <sighs> right over their heads. And they're like, do whatever we ask of you. <laughs> Listen to Jesus' response, though. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. He didn't slap them. He didn't go, oh, sons of thunder. Like, you know, he, he didn't roll his eyes. He didn't. He met them right where they were. That's what Jesus does. He meets you wherever you are. He meets you right where you are. He doesn't say, climb up the ladder to get to me, and now let's meet. He's like, no, no, where are you? What do you want me to do for you? He meets you right where you are. He said, what do you want me to do for you? He asked, and they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You should have stopped, right? Excuse me? Now, let me give some context here, because we read that, and we're thinking, how bold of a, of a request. First, Jesus, do whatever we ask, please. And here's, here's what we're asking. When you come into your glory, we want to be right next to you. We want to be the one sitting next to you when you reign in your glory. Now, we have to go to Matthew's version of the story as Matthew gives and unpacks some other details. That's why there's different gospels, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have different views of what happened in that event and you get different kind of like a, a input and in what's going on and so they're asking something they're actually responding to something that jesus said mark didn't record it, but matthew did this is what it says in matthew 19 27 28 so peter answered him we have left everything to follow you so remember he said that same thing in mark he's like we've left everything 
to follow you. And then comes the whole thing, well, this is what you're going to receive. Verse 28 says, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so Jesus actually painted a picture for them in this scene that Matthew unpacks for us that Mark doesn't, that when he said, you're going to receive brothers, sisters, you know, mothers, fathers, houses, a, a hundredfold here and for eternity, and then he continues to say, and when I go sit in glory, you 12 as disciples will sit in judgment over the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's already told them that they're going to be sitting next to him, but still, James and John, they're like, okay, that's cool. Mom, hey, mom, we want to be right next to him. We want to be the ones sitting right next to Jesus, and they come with that request. When you get to that glory, let me sit on the left, let him sit on the right. You work out on which one of us is on the left and right, but we're going to be right next to you. So do whatever we ask. Oh, man. James, John, they had motives in their heart, right? Right? Okay, so last week, I'm going to repeat a point, and if you were here, repeat this, or maybe fill in the blank if you remember it. Jesus sees me, and he loves me. Remember that? Let's say that together. Jesus sees me, and he loves me. He saw them, and he loved them. Just like the rich young ruler, when he saw him, he loved him. Like, it didn't matter what they did, what they said, whatever. He met them right where they were. Jesus sees James and John, and he loves them. But he sees then the next layer underneath. And we need to understand this about Jesus, is that Jesus sees and knows the motives of our heart, even when we don't see him ourselves. And so he's about to respond to James and John with this bold request, right? We want to sit next to you, Jesus, when you come into glory. Jesus sees and knows the motives of my heart, right? He sees it. And so he responds to them. We're going to keep reading, okay? He responds to them. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Now, let's stop there. Well, no, let's not. They said, we can, right? We can, they answered right away. Whoa, yeah, we can. We can. Although, they, did they just not hear what Jesus said is going to happen to him? Again, clueless, right? They're like, Jesus said, no, they're going to arrest me. They're going to kill me. They're, they're going to flog me. They're going to beat me. It's going to be bad, and... and and that's what's going to happen. Can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? And they don't understand what Jesus is saying. They don't understand the full cup that he has to drink to accomplish the will of his Father. And without that understanding, they go, we can. If it means sit next to you, we can. We're excited. Oh, boy. I want to sit next to you, Jesus, in heaven. Woo! On the left and on the right. Okay, Jesus keeps going. He says, we can. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. He's painting a picture. He's like, he asked them, what do you want from me? And they answered, and then he's like, you don't even know what you're saying, (laughs) right? You don't even know what you're asking. And it's not for me to grant. It's already been granted meaning this is a part of prophecy. This is a part of what God has already decided. The Heavenly Father already has this figured out, and it's set in stone. So you're asking something that isn't yours to get or for Jesus to even give to them. I want you to hear this. He says, you will drink the cup that I drink from. They still have no idea what that means. Because after Jesus' resurrection, you know, they're like, now we get it. Their eyes are open. The Holy Spirit comes. Now they start the church and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And God's word goes out. The gospel starts spreading. James, John, they're a part of that whole movement. Later on, we learn actually in Acts chapter 16 that James was beheaded. And he had to drink the cup that Jesus had to drink of persecution. And... Later on, we read in uh, Revelation chapter 1 that John also experienced persecution in that process, and he was exiled to Patmos. That's what we read in Revelation chapter 1. So both of them, when he said, you will drink the cup, he's like, but you still don't know what that means, and you still don't know what you're asking, right? You don't know what's going to happen. 
So Jesus is like, it's not for me. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John, right? Now that sons, ah! and, and you wonder why were the, the other 10 mad at James and John at this moment? I think it might be because they didn't ask first, <laughs> right? They're like, oh, dang it, they got to Jesus first. I wanted to be at the left or right. And uh, they, they had their mama come up and they like softened the deal. And then, and then they came in and be like, give us what we want, you know? And they're like, so they're indignant at this point that Jesus, they asked Jesus this question. So talk about some disunity in the camp. Now, here's the thing. They were probably already talking about who's going to be important. We know that. They're trying to figure out the pecking order, the disciples. Like, who's in charge of, well, we know Peter's kind of up there, right? But where am I going to be? And, and how's this going to work? And they're still trying to figure this whole thing out. Jesus called them together. Come here. Come here, fellas. And said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He's like, you know how this world works. Those who get into those roles and positions are excited because they get to control everyone underneath them. That's the way the world works. Right now, we have candidates vying for positions, not because they love people, but because they love power. And anybody that goes higher up in power learns and I think gets seduced by the control they have of all those underneath them. It's just a natural, sinful, selfish, fleshly tendency. The more we have rulership over, the more power we want, and the more we control it. He's like, that's the way the kingdoms of this world work. Not so with you. He's, he's trying to teach them. You want to sit at my left and right. You don't even know what you're asking. And you're thinking about the kingdom of heaven, that it's like the kingdom of the world, and it's not. Again, it's upside down. It's completely opposite. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first um, must be slave of all. That's a powerful phrase, isn't it? Not just a servant, but now a slave. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Welcome to the heartbeat of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is trying to teach them. You don't know what you're asking, and you don't understand the kingdom of heaven yet. Here's what it is. Even the Son of Man, the one that came with all the authority, power of God's presence in heaven on earth, did not come to use his power, his authority to condemn, control, manipulate, and lead over. He came to do what? To serve. Not only just serve other people and bless other people and be there for everyone else, but to the point of giving his life as a ransom. What's a ransom? A ransom is something that has to be paid to set somebody else free, right? If somebody is kidnapped and they say, here's the ransom, pay that ransom and we'll set that person free. Jesus paid the ransom for our kidnapping to sin, to set us free from sin, to be with God forever. And right now he's saying, that's why I came. If you want to be my disciples, you need to understand this kingdom is upside down, upside down. Now, here's, here's what I think James and John had. They had zeal without knowledge. Have you ever been like that before? Let me use an illustration. Let's imagine that you had a great uncle that you didn't even know about who was really rich. And you get a letter in the mail from an attorney that says you're inheriting a large amount of money from an inheritance from your great uncle that you didn't even know. And we're working out the details. We'll let you know when that's coming. What will you probably start doing in your head? spending it, right? So you're like, like, how much? And oh my gosh, and what am I going to do with that? And oh, what can, what can I get? What can I pay off? What can I, you know, wow, wow. You start kind of getting the, like excited about what this thing is going to come in as an inheritance. And in your mind, you have already started making plans for what you're going to do with it. And it's not even in your hands, right? That's just a natural tendency, of, I think, of us as humans. Like, we, that's what we would do. We'd be excited and start acting before we even have it in our hand. That's being zealous without knowledge, right? It's, it's, it's um, doing something with something that isn't put in your hand yet. So often in life, when we think about position, we think about, I don't know, I, I, there's probably, for all of us in this room, there's some kind of ladder that we've tried to climb whether it's the ladder of approval 
We're just trying to find our approval. Maybe we didn't get it as kids from our parents or from our dad or our mom, and like we're just trying to climb the ladder of approval. And would somebody just uh, just give me approval, like make me feel like I matter? And so we just start climbing that ladder and trying to do whatever it takes to get up that ladder. Or maybe it's it is the ladder of goodness, like I. I know God, and I believe in him, but I got to be good enough to get to him, and I'm just trying to be good enough and climbing that ladder of goodness, or, or maybe it is power, prestige, or position, or career, or like there's, all of us have some kind of ladder that we're trying to climb, and, um, and sometimes we want the top of the ladder, or we want the glory without the cross, And we don't understand people that have achieved certain things in life or done certain, like, pretty amazing things, you don't know all the prices they paid to get there. Whether, and that can be even for Christians, right, as Christ followers. You see something that's like, they are just godly. I, just, I would love to be them or have what they have or experience what they experience, but you may not understand all the crosses that they have to, had to carry to get to where they are in that relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> when we have zeal without knowledge or we want the crown without the cross with, with our relationship with God it can lead us towards demand prayers God give me whatever I ask from you and we start treating God like that genie Give me what I ask for. Give me what I ask for. And when he doesn't give it to you, you're angry at him. When God sees the motives of your heart and he knows if he gave that to you, it would ruin you. It wouldn't help you grow. It wouldn't bring you closer to him. It would just fulfill a need and even a temporary need or even just a want in a temporary want. Jesus sees me and he loves me. And he knows what I need. And so when we see James and John's response, they're missing the point because they're thinking about their own glory. And they're thinking, can you carry the cross? Oh, we can do it? And they have no idea what that means, right? that we can have that kind of zeal without knowledge of what it's going to cost in that process. But for us to be like Jesus, he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to what? Serve and give. That word is a, all there a lot of times with Jesus. To give his life as a ransom for many. The first will be last. The last will be first. The kingdom of heaven is upside down. And for us to live in the kingdom of God, we need to understand our calling and God's will. And I'm going to simplify your calling and God's will for your life right now. Because your calling is to do God's will in order to bring God glory. That's it. That is, that James and John were asked, flipping that. They're thinking our calling is to do our will and be next to God's glory. Right? And so they were working for it. They're like, yeah, I'm going to get it. We want it. You give it to us. And that's what they were looking for. No, our calling is to do God's will. What is God's will? Whatever. Congratulations. Now you know God's will. God's will for your life is whatever. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm going to read a verse. All right, so let me help you understand this. Jesus, Jesus gives us this model and example, by, by the way, that our calling is to do God's will in order to bring God glory. Jesus did not come to do his will on earth. You see all the time when he goes before his heavenly father, I'm here to do your will, heavenly father. Okay? And we see in one of his prayers, as he was praying before he was about to be arrested and go to the cross for us, in John 17, we see these prayers that are so good because he pray, prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, he prays for the church. He prays that we would be one like he and the Father are one, this oneness of the body of Christ. Like he prays all these things. And in the middle of this prayer, he gives us this, this awesome, beautiful insight. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. That's where eternal life is found. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He's like, they know you and they know me. That leads them towards eternal life. That is eternal life. 
I have brought you glory on earth. He's talking to his heavenly father. I have brought you all the glory on earth, God. I haven't tried to steal it. I haven't tried to take it from you. I have not been like, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's not the way Jesus lived. He said, I lived. I brought you glory, heavenly father, on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do by doing your will, God. Each day I did your will and I brought you glory. I did your will and I brought you glory. Do you know what God's will is for you today? Whatever. Whatever you're doing, do it for God's glory, not yours, right? Do it because God has given you the ability to do it, not to raise yourself up on the ladder, look at me, but to keep yourself on the, on the position to serve those around you and bless uh, those around you. We see that Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 23, 24, and verse 31, he says this, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. He's talking to the Christians in, in the church in Corinth. He's like, yeah, we have free will. Isn't that awesome? Okay, no, not for you. All right. <laughs> Isn't it cool you have free will, right? That you're not a robot, that God's like, like, no, no, you get choices. We get choices every single day. Everything is permissible. He's saying, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I mean, it's not everything's good, but I could do everything. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Actually, there's a lot of things that are destructive, right? And we know what those things are in our life that create destructive situations. He says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of who? Others. It's like when you're living your life to do God's will, you're just living for others. Doing what? Whatever. Let's, let's go down to verse 31. This is where we find this. So, say it with me, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. He's like, here's God's will for you. Whatever. <laughs> like, like what, if you're eating, you're drinking, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it for the glory of God, you're doing it in God's will. Isn't that awesome? So that means if you're here today and you're not living for yourself, but you're learning to live for others, you're doing God's will. So stop trying to beat yourself up over wondering, what is God's will for my life? What am I supposed to do? What? And I know you have big decisions. Do I take this job, that job? Do I date this person, not date him? Do we get married? Do we not get married? Do we have kids? Do we not have kids? Do we buy a cat? No. Like, so you have all these decisions <laughs> you have to make in life whatever <laughs> whatever you do do it for the glory of God like I, these big decisions here's the cool thing God meets us in the middle of those and he says I will walk with you to seek me day by day but don't worry about the great big what is my will you know kind of a thing because when we do that so often we miss his daily will which is just serving people around us when we're worried about God's big will for us we actually start just thinking about us when we live in God's will for us today by serving and loving and being around other people, as we do that, his big will just shows up. And he leads us and he guides us and we walk by the Spirit and we learn the word of God and like all these are good things. I'm spending way too much time on this, okay? So often we want glory and recognition. There's, now, let me side note, there's nothing wrong with wanting affirmation, okay? It's good to get affirmation from other people, isn't it? Like when you do something good, it's okay to receive it when they say, that, you did awesome at that. Don't be like, oh, God's glory, God's glory, God's glory. You, that's when you become over-Christian, okay? That's when it's like, that person's weird. Every time I say good job, they go, oh, God, glory. And you're like, okay, that's awesome. Give God glory, but don't be weird. Um, <laughs> you can receive affirmation like, you did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. And then you go to God and you say, God, thank you, Right? That's between you and, you and Jesus to bring God glory in that process. But don't be the one that searches for glory and recognition in your own. Can I talk about worship on Sunday mornings for a moment? Can I talk about this? Can we get real? Yeah. All right. If you don't want to be real, just plug your ears right now, okay? Because let's be real. We show up at church on a Sunday morning, and you guys are coming in and bringing all your stuff with you, right? And, um, and I don't know if you notice, I'm ha out there hanging out when you're coming in now, like, and saying good morning to you. And maybe some of you are like, oh, that's the pastor. <laughs> you know, like, and um, I'm just there to say hey, all right? So, like, if you want to talk, I'll talk. And, and um, but it just, I love spending that time with you. But when you come in, you're bringing everything with you, aren't you? 
And uh, whether that's your grocery list or that's that you yell at your kid while you're on your way to get here or whether that's, you know, you're, you're, um, you're just really stressed about something that you've carried all week long or whether you're coming, you're like, you know, life's pretty good. You know, you're bringing you and all of who you are into this place. And you're mixing with all the other people that are bringing all of who they are and all that they have into this space. And then we say, hey, let's stand and sing a song. And you're like, I don't want to. <laughs> Can I be real? Like some of you are new to church and you're like, this is weird. Like what other place do you go to that you show up and it's like, everybody now do this and everybody close your eyes and now everybody stand up and everybody look at the words on the screen and everybody let's sing together. And you're like, this is weird, right? We can call it what it is. You don't do this anywhere else. You don't go to the office and be like, we're all standing together looking at the same screen and we're all going, ah, like it doesn't happen. So I'm just going to be real with you for a moment. It can be weird. It can be weird. And then, and then, then all of a sudden, like the Holy Spirit does something, and you like, you like feel this little nudge, and you're like, what was that? What was that? That was, I don't know about that. And uh, and maybe you've come for a long time, and you're like, you get excited for that. What was that? Right? Like you're like something like Jesus just does something and, and speaks to you. But for some of it, it's it's weird when you start figuring out how God and the Holy Spirit works, and like being in the presence with the body of Christ, and like just focusing our attention on Him. That's what we do when we sing. It's like everything else that just melted away. But so often when we're in a space together and, um, and somebody in the room like feels really comfortable in worship and then they're just both hands up in the air. And it's like, that is so cool. Some people, you're like, that is so weird. And some of you are like, use more deodorant, right? Like some, <laughs> like... Now, do we have any self-conscious people? You're not gonna raise your hand, right? All right, some of you will. All right. <laughs> Subconscious people are like it's like the introverts. Everybody jump if you're introverted. It's like no. <laughs> we come to worship God, but we are still stuck in ourselves. Yeah. And and worshiping God musically, so often we can't get past our own insecurities. That like even if we start to do this, but our eyes are looking at the words, and the whole time you're thinking, is is anybody looking at me right now? Can anybody see what I'm doing right now? Or maybe you're doing this and you're like can people see that I'm worshiping Jesus? Can people see that I just, I am in love with Jesus? I just, hopefully somebody's looking at me do this, right? And all of a sudden, worship turns from he to me, and we start worrying about it. And then you have these, like, worship hand motions where it's like, you know, this one is carrying the TV, you know, worship moment. And then and you got, I caught a fish this big, Jesus, I caught a fish this big, and heartburn, going to heartburn. <laughs> Right, like, like that's from Tim Hawkins. If you haven't watched Tim Hawkins' comedian do those hand motions, it's just we can do things like that, and you almost just have to make light of yourself and be like, you know, it is silly that I feel so insecure, and it, and it, and there are things that you think people are judging. Just you know, they're not, and if they are, who cares? They're not Jesus. They're just as insecure as you are. And they're trying to figure out what is happening in this place. This is weird. <laughs> and um, when we show up here on Sundays, I want you to know, when we sing songs, let's just think of the glory of God. Amen. There are a few moments in your week, I promise you. There are a few moments in your week. And I, this week, our, our pastoral staff, Pastor Jim, Nikki, and myself, went to a, a conference at Ashland Seminary for for healing care um, stuff. And it was so good. And I love the phrase they used. It's like, we want to get to those moments where the, the, the gap in space between us and, and heaven is so thin, we can feel it. Right? That we're not worrying about us and we're not worrying about them. And it's like, we can sense that heaven is right here. That's when we start to live and worship in God's glory. And so I would take advantage of it when you show up here, right? There's no other space like this in your week where you get to just come, let's get as close to heaven as we can get together and experience God's glory. We only get moments like that. Let's, let's soak them up for all they worth. I, I love Isaiah 26, 8. This is a great passage. This should be our heart. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws. I mean, I know your word, your truth. I'm walking in that, not legalistically, not like, oops, I messed up so I don't get it. Like, but I'm walking towards you, Jesus. We wait for you, that thin space between us and heaven. Like, we long for that because your name, God, and your renown are the desires of our heart. It's what I long for every single day because my calling is to do God's will and to bring him glory and create that thin space every day. 
where that becomes the desire of my heart. And Jesus is trying to teach James and John about this. And we're going to see he teaches his disciples with the next part of the passage in an interaction with somebody else. So we're transitioning now, okay? We're transitioning because we're going to learn about Bartimaeus because now they're moving, okay? You guys ready to keep moving? Okay, let's move. He says, then they came to Jericho. So they're on the way to Jerusalem. They're on their way to Jerusalem where Jesus knows he's going to be killed, right? He, and, and he's on the way there. They get to Jericho. He's going there resolutely. He's like on plan. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a, bland, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. If you were blind in the culture in this point of history, that's all you could do. You were an outcast. If you had any kind of um, disability like this, um, you were considered unclean. You were considered God cursed you. Like you have to just go. You can't get a job. If you were married and you become blind, you now can't live with your spouse any longer in your home. You're cast out. Like you see how bad it is for those in this point of history that had these type of disabilities. And at this point, there was no LASIK eye surgery, right? There was no, like, there was no medicine. There was no medical doctors working on the eyes to do anything. If you're blind, you're blind. That's it. There's no glasses. You don't go to get your prescription and, oh, I didn't know I could see like this. Like, this man has been blind, and we don't know from birth or it happened later on, but he is blind, and he is out there, and he is begging. Jesus and this crowd shows up as he's walking. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is important. He calls him son of David. That is the um, assigned name of the Messiah. He doesn't call him Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't say, oh, healer, come and heal me. He calls him by his prophetic name as the Messiah. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. They're like, shush, Bartimaeus. Jesus is important. And we're all following him and coming to just settle down over here. Jesus, Pete, you're just annoying us. That's what they're doing to him. Why? He's outcast. He's dirty. He's unclean. Jesus is coming. So you stay over there. <laughs> he said, I don't care. <laughs> he shouted all the more and all the louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. He calls out. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called uh, to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. So now it moved from shut up to cheer up. Like, like, <laughs> oh, we didn't know it was going to, oh, now, now all these people who are following have heard of Jesus. Some of them have seen Jesus do some of the miraculous work. And now they're wondering, whoa, is he going to do something awesome? Are we going to witness this? He's now, don't shut up, cheer up. Like, come on, on your feet. He's calling you throwing his cloak aside. Of course he did. He's, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. He's like, I'm all in. If he's calling my name, I'm running. Listen to the question. What do you want me to do for you? Remember that question? Jesus sees you and meets you right where you are. He did it with James and John in their ignorance. <laughs> You don't know what you're asking, right? And now he comes to Bartimaeus, who they were saying to shut up and stay over there. He calls in and he says, so what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him, and the blind man said, Rabbi, which means teacher, I want to see. He doesn't say, Rabbi, do whatever I ask for you to do for me, right? He doesn't say, you make me see. He tells him what he wants. I want to see. I've been blind. Go, Jesus said. Your what? Your faith has healed you. And how quickly? 
Immediately he received his sight. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Imagine if you've been blind your whole life and the first thing that you see with your physical eyes is the face of Jesus. Whew. That's a good day. That's a good day. You think about those who live in this life right now and walk with blindness their whole life. When they die, the first face they see is Jesus. Whoa. I think we take that for granted, don't we? He received a sight. And what did he do? Oh, he's following Jesus. <laughs> he's like, you, I'm with you, son of David. I'm with you. I immediately, I'm healed. And where are we going? <laughs> I'm with you, right? I'm on the path. I am right behind you, Jesus. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to see what you see because now I can see. And I'm with you, Jesus. Let's learn the difference between James and John and Bartimaeus. Let's learn the difference. When I see Bartimaeus, I see he was humble. Right? James and John were a little the opposite. <laughs> they were pretty proud. Let us sit next to you, Jesus. We want to be next to your glory. Bartimaeus came in. He was humble. Why? He had to be humble. But even his response to Jesus, he was humble. He's like, I can't do any of this myself. But I know you can. And so he humbled himself before Jesus. He humbled himself so much to not even care what everybody else was saying for him to do. Shut up. Stay over there. Shut. I don't care. Son of David. He's like, I, I, my humility is all over me, and I don't care what you see, because I want to see. And in his humility, he was absolutely determined. <laughs> He's like, if the son of David is walking next to me. I am bound and determined without anybody getting in my way or anything getting in my way. I am coming to him. I'm throwing down my cloak. I am going to where he is. And man, when he calls my name, I'm on it. Nothing is hindered, hindering me. And when he was healed, what did he do? He followed Jesus. He didn't lead Jesus. <laughs> He's like, cool, I can see now. You guys follow me, right? Like, no, 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 no. In his humility... Now he's determined to follow Jesus. He became a Jesus follower, y'all. I don't want us to be like James and John in this scene. Now, James and John get it right later, okay? Why? Because God sees them and sees what they need, and he loves them right where they are. But understand your need for mercy and follow Jesus for God's glory. That's, that's what we're called to do. Let's not understand what we want from Jesus. I want my ice cream. I want my ice cream, right? I want my sucker. I want my, like, it's not about what I want. I want Jesus. And when you want Jesus, do you know what you get? Jesus. Jesus is so much better than all the suckers and ice cream in the world, <laughs> right? It's way better than the things that I'm asking for, the things I desire, the position I think I deserve, that the, you know, all that stuff. When I humble myself and I learn to understand, I need mercy. Yes. And when I cry out daily, it isn't God, put me on the throne. It's God, I give you the throne. Have mercy on me. See me and love me. Today I'm going to follow you, I'm going to live and love others, and I'm going to live for God's glory and renown. When we start doing that, we start getting it right. And just to be honest with you, living like that is so much fun. So much fun. The more you live for yourself, the more depressed you're going to get. The more you live for God and others, the more you realize Jesus was right. <laughs> and it's fun. It is so much fun. We're going to take some time to respond here this morning, and, and we're going to respond with a special song. So let's just take a moment in prayer. God, thank you for your word. Thank you when we get to see um, scenes like this in Scripture that teach us about us. That it, It's the mirror. Your word is like a mirror that reflects us to us and you to us, and, and we get to see those areas of our heart and life that that need to change, that need to grow. And it's, it's not out of guilt, but it's out of your love and mercy. It's not out of compulsion or legalism, but it's out of grace. 
And so as we come before you, if you're saying anything to us right now, Spirit of God, we want to be willing to respond to it. Let me challenge all of us in in the room who are, are Christ followers, okay, for a moment this is one of the hardest things for us to to deal with or answer, but I want the Holy Spirit to do some work in us right now. I want you to ask the question right now of God. Don't ask me, don't don't ask you, just ask God, God, where in my life am I being, where am I being selfish? Where am I being like James and John? Where is pride getting in the way of me living for your glory? I just want you to take a moment and as you spend that time with Jesus, like just asking him, let him work in you. Maybe he might bring a word to mind. He might bring an image or a relationship to mind or something. He may just just be willing to hear from him right now as you ask him that question. Where am I allowing pride to make me not live for your glory? Now, if you don't know Jesus yet and you don't have a relationship with him and and today you are feeling this thing inside of you, just, you know, that's what God does. He, he, he kind of tugs on your heart. <laughs> and he says, I want to be with you. And he wants you to be with him. And the only way to get to him is through his son, Jesus. And it's through a confession and a, and a belief. It's confessing with your mouth that Jesus is the son of God and he died on the cross to pay your ransom, to pay for your sin, so he could ransom you to heaven to be with God. You get to experience forgiveness of sin, eternity with God forever, and start this relationship with this God that loves you and sees you and knows you. But it's only through Jesus. So you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart that that is true. And it's through your faith that you're saved, nothing else. No climbing ladders, no being good enough, no like getting it right today and tomorrow and the next day. Like you're only saved because God loves you and he sent his son to die for you. That's the only thing that saves you. And if that's you today, I would encourage you to be like Bartimaeus. Cry out to him, Lord, have mercy on me. I am blind and I want to see. I want to see you, God. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. You can pray this. Make it your own words if you want to, but, but definitely make it from your own heart, your own confession. You can say, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for my ransom to pay for my sin and to forgive me now and forever for it for cleaning the slate and my record in heaven and making me right before you I believe he rose again and that he is alive today and I can be alive with him now and forever in eternity so today I'm crying out have mercy on me God I give you my life, and I want you to be the Lord. I want to live for your glory, not mine anymore. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.